Great. All right, so I'm really excited to introduce our speaker tonight, Paula Garavito. So um, Paula is a post back student. Uh, she's been in my lab at IPI for a year in one day now, and she's going to share her story about uh, what she's been working on for the past year. So yeah, Paula, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Let me share my screen. Thank you. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Cool. Um, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so like I said, my name is Paula and I am a Rosetta Postbox student. I've been in the lab for a year and I have been working on the now design of uh, mini proteins to inhibit bacterial biofilm formation. So, this is a brief outline of what I'll be talking about today. I will be going over uh, what biofilms are and then the lab system. I will talk about the mini protein side design and the, the strategy and how we basically filter and came up with the designs that we ordered. And then I will go over the experimental workflow of how we tested the design so far. Uh, so I'll start talking about what biofilms are um, so biofilms are complex communities of microbes that can grow on many different surfaces. Um, they, they become, once they basically go through the biofilm cycle, they can attach the surfaces and they produce this extracellular matrix that, uh, that is known to be really difficult to deal with um, because you have different microorganisms living in this matrix and they're also known to become resistant to antibiotics at this point. So they're quite difficult to treat at this point. And biofilms are basically, I can hear a little bit of myself. I think, okay, <laughs> good. Um, and biofilms basically make our lives a little harder in many ways, because again, since they can attach to many surfaces, they can live in many places, such as your teeth. They're also one of the main causes of respiratory bacterial infections. They can contaminate water supplies. Um, they can be found plenty of medical devices and cause a lot of infections because of this. They also can even be in oil pipes, which to me is still like impressive that literally can find them anywhere and survive in so many different environments. Um, if we take a look at the biofilm cycle again, one of the most critical um, points in this cycle is the attachment step, uh, because this is what first determines if the bacteria can even form the biofilm or not. Um, it's important to highlight that this is like a really well-studied and conserved mechanism in gram-negative gram bacteria, so the adhesion step. And therefore, this is kind of what my target was and basically how can we inhibit the biofilm formation? Progress. Um, so yeah, focusing a little more on the attachment step. So how is this attachment being like regulated? So we have a lab A adhesin in the surface of the bacteria that basically, uh, let me get my pointer really quick. Cool. Yeah, so once it's present in the outer membrane of the bacteria, then it can, the bacteria knows to attach and then start forming the biofilm. So in gram-negative bacteria, we have the outer membrane, the periplasm, and the inner membrane. And with this like membrane system, we have the lab system that regulates the lab A adhesin in the surface of the bacteria. Where, again, if the lab A is present, then biofilm will form. And the way this is regulated is basically, it is an environmental response. So if the environment is not good, then this lab G protease in the periplasm, it's able to cleavage the lab A adhesin from the surface of the bacteria, which once that's released, then it's not longer present, the bacteria can really attach, so then you get no biofilm formation. But the other way around is if you basically have good environmental conditions, then um, your, the lab D receptor, it's able to um, sequester the LabG protease and kind of hold it in place. And so LabG is not able to cleavage the LabG adhesin anymore from the outer membrane of the bacteria. So then you will have this present and then you will go through the whole biofilm cycle of attachment, production of the matrix and maturation and kind of continue on. So 
our idea is to basically create an inhibitor for this protein-protein interaction, the LabD and the LabG uh, system. And ideally, we our target is um, LabG. And we definitely, this was something we thought about, like what, which will be the best. Obviously, we can target different proteins within the system, but we decided that LabG was the most um, suitable target because you know the bacteria can attempt to overcome the inhibitor by modulating the abundance of a protein, right? So, but if you modulate the abundance of LabG, um, that only kind of helps our function of having more LabG presence in the periplasm and continue to cleavage the lab by adhesin, um, rather than maybe targeting the LabD receptor. Um, and so now like I can go over a little more. So what is the strategy that we can choose to design these inhibitors? Um, so, um, I'll take a step back, right? So again, if our inhibitors can bind to LabG, then we won't have the attachment because LabG will always be present instead of being bound to LabD, even if the environment is good. And then it will be able to cleavage the lab by adhesin. And we won't have the production of matrix and we won't have the maturation. So this is maybe like the big picture idea of why we wanna um, inhibit this system. And so the strategy we chose to design this inhibitor was many proteins. So we don't know what we might have to do to get this molecule into the periplasm for one, or to bind to lab G, but we chose to design a strategy that can create molecules we know how to mutate, like mini proteins. Um, mini proteins are protein-like enough that we can leverage the existence of protein design still to create them and they have distinct surfaces that we can mutate. They're also small enough that we can screen them in high throughput and re-engineer successful hits according to our downstream needs all at once. So we basically can have like the best of both worlds, kind of the protein functionality, but also being small enough that we can test all these designs as well. Um, so this is kind of why we went with designing mini proteins. So I will go over kind of the strategy now of how the mini proteins were designed. Um, so the current state of our like of designing mini proteins, it's basically you usually want to start with a structure a structural fragment that already has an interface to your target, right? Um, structural fragment most likely being an alpha helix that it already creates a good interaction with hot spot residues that can bind to the target, and then you kind of build the use Rosetta to build the residues, sorry, to build the backbone around and do the residue level design and design your mini proteins. However, we can encounter a bigger challenge here because ideally, if you look at the structure of the lab D protease and the lab D output domain, there is this beautiful interaction right here that it almost seems like is the anchor point of the full interaction between the complex. It's the single trip to find on a loop and it's a like fantastic hotspot residue to use on a piece of secondary structure that we don't know yet how to accommodate, right? It is on a loop. Um, and so I like to say this a lot because when I joined the lab a year ago, I joined as a Rosetta Postback student and I also really wanted to learn computational design. I had never ever done anything with computers, really. I had taken a class in Python and that was about it. So I definitely wanted to challenge and really merge myself on what Rosetta is and how to design proteins. So we came up with the idea of kind of creating a new tool, right, to span how can we design these proteins. And that's uh, designing a whole protein from a single residue um, instead of a helix. So it's been it was a really excited challenge um, because we kind of, I was, didn't know how to do this initially. And, um, but it was a really exciting approach and we were able to be successful with it. And so the um, protocol that we designed, it's basically kind of, I'm gonna go over it now. Um, so we initially give Rosetta, this is our starting structure where you have the tryptophan and then the lab G. Um, and this is everything we give it. We still want to conserve the native interaction between the tryptophan and LabG. And we also realized that, like I said, we want to keep this on the tryptophan loop 
because initially my first stage of design, I try to put everything on helices, kind of following maybe the more traditional approach or the current approach of protein design. And then I realized um, it wasn't really feasible. Um, it was generating a lot of helix gains. Rosetta didn't like it too much. So I decided to, well, we have to stay on a loop. It almost seems like the loop is the best spot to keep it as well and kind of build from there. But in order to do that, we basically had to come up with new innovative ideas to be able to sample this. Um, so Frank, my which Frank tweets is my mentor as well, who taught me a lot of the computational um, stuff that I've done so far. Um, this, he basically made this remitter sampling that we can use the tryptophan as the anchor point for the rest of the designs, right? So we traditionally for protein design, we hold the backbone in place and rotate the side chain. But here we're keeping the side chain in place and rotating the chi angle so we can find a like a good set of chi angles that can accommodate a backbone, right? Because at this point we don't really have a backbone. There's literally just the, the tryptophan. <laughs> and then from there, once we found this like ideal uh, um spaces, then we can start adding the structural fragments to it. Um, so this is a really excited thing because as soon as we started doing this, we realized that we could start adding fragments. Then we, Frank also generated a substitution mover that it's able to build this uh, fragments on the backbone while it's still keeping um, the tryptophan in the loop, as you can see right here. Uh, we definitely have a couple of uh, criteria is when we started doing this one also keeping the tryptophan stable in that loop making sure the interaction is in the native interaction is being disturbed uh, we also wanted to take in consideration the interface design um, at this point because we wanted to make sure that we we're generating initial fragments that could be designable for the interface because we don't just want the tryptophan to be the only um, binding point and we also generated, well, Frank generated the interocitor, which is an unpublished metric that I'll cover a little more about later on. But we can basically test the cooperativity of the interface at this point and use it to, you know, measure the criteria so make sure that our helixes are closed but not clashing, that the tryptophan is staying in place, and that we also are generating already an interface at this point, which is an early stage of design, which he was really excited to be able to use this metric um, with Frank. Um, the next step in the design process is basically once we have that two helix bond, um, two helix, the helix loop helix fragment, then now we can use so anything to create a helical bundle. Um, initially, I did try to maybe do more than three helical bundles. I kind of went up to six helical bundles and just kind of use Rosetta again, in all these metrics to evaluate what was the best um, design strategy. Um, overall, the three Helix bundles seem to make the best interface and just be more favorable uh, compared to going to like four Helix or five Helix bundles. Um, and then again, I use um, the interocitor to measure the cooperativity in this stage and be able to evaluate also the fragments that we're adding to create um, the three helix bundle, right? Because we basically use native fragments and kind of stand them. So we will also use the interests that are at this point to filter on those fragments. So that again, optimizing how we can build these mini proteins at this stage. Um, and this is really important because if you have been working with protein design, we know that um, sequence design can be quite challenging and it's also more computational expensive, can be slower as well. So if we can use the metrics such as an interocitor to generate great backbones at this point, it's only making the design process faster. Um, so this was really excited that we're able to use it at this point, but I still think it's taking consideration the, inter, um, the interface of our, our designs. Again, with the idea that if you have great backbones, then maybe the, like the sequence design will be faster and better. Um, then after that, um, we basically do the sequence design. For my sequence design, I, the, I use fast design and layer, district, uh, layer restriction designs. And I just basically use the standard reset of flexible backbone design. And this was so that we can take in consideration, right, the amino, amino acids we want in the core. We want a hydrophobic core to, again, um, be able to um, 
for folding, to help with folding, to have a stable pores with no voids, um, a hydrophilic surface to interact with the solvent, and also keeping an idea of engineering these um, surfaces if we're thinking about coming to the peroplasm, um, and also allowing Rosetta to design the interface residues. Um, again, kind of trusting the Rosetta score function to have the best um, uh, residues at the interface and checking for uh, evaluating the binding interactions. Um, so after this, we basically uh, generated a lot of the science. So I just kind of wanted to show this awesome picture where you can see how diverse the designs are. Uh, again, with sewing, I just kind of let Rosetta, using these metrics um, that I talked about early, I can let Rosetta design and see what's the best position, create different interfaces, different, um, you know, find insights, uh, which was like really excited to see this initially, um, just because I, I mean, I, I really love what I do here and just seeing all the little mini proteins forming in different diversity, um, it was fun for me. And then I also have a few more designs just so you can kind of see what I mean. Like again, the trip to find is being kept in place, we're keeping it in a loop, but at the same time, we're giving the flexibility of designing more interfaces. Um, but yeah, and so now I'm gonna, after I kind of created this protocol, we decided to move forward with production and generating more designs with the design requirements that I just talked about, right? We want to have um, support the tryptophan, um, have a stable backbone, and be able to generate interfaces that will bind to LabG. I basically run a lot of jobs on Andromeda, which is their supercomputer. I generated about 20,000 designs. Uh, this is my artistic interpretation of Frank and Andromeda, because uh, Frank built Andromeda. Uh, so I'm super thankful to have actually the computational power to be able to run all these jobs as well. Um, this is Andromeda, and that's me saying <laughs> um, it's, it's been awesome working in this lab and seeing Andromeda get built. I try to help a little, but it's just great to have it. Um, yeah, and so after I generated 20,000 designs, I also evaluated all of the designs to filter them down to 12,000 designs um, with the Rosetta metrics. So some of the metrics that uh, I kind of look into were, you know, 12,000 designs are a lot of designs and it's not ideal to look to them like every single design. You can't just look at all of them or at least I wouldn't want to look at 12,000 designs either. So we kind of evaluated based on different criteria Binding criteria and a stability and core quality. Um, so these are some of the metrics that we chose. I kind of looked at shape complementarity, where we can kind of see the better binding shape technically will fit well, and we will get a tight binders as well. Uh, we can also check at use DG separated to see the change in energy of the forming complex, right? Where it measures like the complex as it's being separated and the energy again of the residues is being like coming back together. And then it gives you the change in that. Um, and for example, for shape complementarity, I kind of use some of the previous studies that have been done with mini protein in three helical bundles where we know we probably want it to be above 0.6. So I kind of use this as a, as a cutout for the library. Uh, for the binding energy, I evaluated the native complex of the LabD and the LabG structures, and then I basically kind of try to choose a cutoff based on that. So my designs technically have to be as good as Rosetta scored the native interaction or better. Um, another metric that we looked at was uh, the binding interface area. Um, the idea that maybe having a larger interface can also give you more connections as well. And again, using past work that has been done with mini proteins, um, kind of 1,200 caught up. I was a little more flexible about it in here, but still kind of keeping that in mind that technically this should give us a better interface as well. Um, the next thing we looked at was kind of the attractive, the Leonard Jones attractive between, um, energy between the atoms and different residues in the core. Um, again, with the idea of maybe we wanted to kind of evaluate how, I can't look at all the designs by eyes, but maybe this was a metric to be able to see how uh, well they are packing together um, 
and if there are any voids within the mini proteins and kind of find different cutoffs to um, generate the designs. Um, this is kind of exciting because I, again, I try to score everything according to the native interaction and all the past literature. But then the next metric, which is again, looking at the interocitor is basically how I evaluated most of the library. Uh, with the interocitor, we can measure the structural cooperativity of the interface, um, so affinity, but we can also look at the stability of, of the protein as a monomer as well. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we can use it at really early stages to generate better backbones, but we can also evaluate interfaces at the end. So it was really excited to use this tool and kind of help Frank um, you know, see where the metrics are in the library and kind of test the whole process um, of the interocitor. And so after I basically went through all these metrics, I um, ordered 12,000 unique designs as an oligo pool. And my idea was to cut them, optimize them for yeast because I wanted to use yeast display technology as my initial um, experimental workflow. Um, so I'm gonna kind of jump gears a little from the computational side to the actual experimental work that I have done so far. Uh, I think it's exciting to also say that I got the library about a month ago. So it's been a really excited month to kind of test all my designs and all that. I definitely spent most of my year working on computational design and being able to develop these protocols. Um, yeah, so just really quick, an oligo pool, we use an oligo pool uh, synthesis where again, we go from the design stage to basically getting all this, uh, being able to order these designs um, that are made in a chip. And like you basically get all the unique designs in a single tube, and then you can amplify them and put them into um, a yeast vector, and then they're ready to be transformed into yeast. Um, so the initial idea of using yeast displays was for screening. So we wanted to um, and use fluorescence activated cell sorting to be able to find binders to lab G. And the idea here is basically once you get the oligo pools, you can transform them into yeast. And then you can use um, the AGA system to display your mini proteins. Um, and then you can also put a make tag to use flow cytometry, cytometry with the idea that if this is present, it means the mini proteins are also being displayed. Um, this is a bit of the workflow that I kind of just, I, am re I really like to have images because I think it's like nice to be able to see how the work is happening. Basically, I got the oligo pools, I transformed them into yeast, and then we can use flow cytometry to check uh, for display for binders and then kind of sort on the cells that are displaying and have binders. Um, so this was our initial screen of display. Um, so right here you have display and cells. So it's the number of cells that are actually displaying the mini proteins. It was really exciting because we got about 45% display, uh, which is really, it was impressive at this point. I was already really happy about it. Again, I didn't this mini pro I had no idea how this, this experimental workflow was going to go. Um, and then I also did a control to make sure that uh, the mini proteins are binding to something, uh, any other reagent we're in the experiment, right? In this experiment, there is no lab G present, so they shouldn't be binding to anything because they were specifically assigned to lab, uh, bind to lab G. Then basically, after that, you can actually check for binding. Um, using the strep avidin. And so at the same time that I was waiting for the um, oligo pool to arrive, I also purified the lab G protein, I, bi I biotilinated, and then I cool I bind it to strep avidin. So with the idea that now you can check for this signal where your mini protein should be bound to lab G and then display this as well. Um, and so this was the data for this. And that was a really excited day because we, again, this is the control we definitely saw binders. Um, that was the first time seeing them as well. So I was really, really excited. Um, so then after this, we basically went through another successive round, other successive rounds of facts to enrich for the cells that were showing display and binders for LabG. Um, so I actually went through this um, process about three times. And after I kept, you know, going through all of this, I basically, so this, which if, again, you're 
looking at display and binding, um, and we can clearly see two illustrations um, where we, at this point, assume that we have two individual binders, um, unique binders to lab G. Um, so after this, I basically sorted on these cells. Um, and again, I really like showing the workflow, but after the sort, I played in my cells and then I sent things for sequencing to see what the clones were. Uh, so this was really exciting because again, we were right, we got two unique um, clones that bind to lab G. Uh, when I got the sequences, they all match the, um, the original way that they were designed. So they're first, like they're basically what I designed them to be. Um, it's also like really nice to highlight. So just here, like, right, this is the mini protein. This is lab G. The tryptophan is right here. Um, the tryptophan is right here. It's also nice to see the diversity. They are built differently. And that was also excited to see. Um, and then as soon as I got all this data, we also just kind of wanted to, again, this is, we were, we didn't know how this was going to work and how the metrics were kind of evaluating the designs. Uh, but now we'll show where do they fall within the 12,000 designs. Um, so these are the same graphs I showed early, but now you're actually seeing this is uh, the first slab G binder one, and this is two. Um, they are a little better on the uh, delta delta G. They are kind of middle for shape complementary. Um, for the DSASA and DG separator for the binding energy in the binding interface area, they are a little bit above, right? Still keeping that, I guess the 12,000, uh, 1200, right? You are above that um, as well here. They were, on, this one was definitely on the top. Um, when we look at how well the um, core is back, they're also kind of like middles for the core attractive energy right here. Um, and then this is like really excited uh, for the interocitor they were in this range, which I think it was one of the most excited things to see. Again, and I just like, I like love working with this metric because we used it as such an early stage of our design. Uh, from the moment we start adding fragments to the tryptophan to pick all of these designs and it made the process a lot better the whole time. Um, and it was just nice kind of seeing that we are picking better designs and kind of improving the protein design um, tools as well. So this was a lot of really excited data to see. And I guess the next step in my workflow was basically, can we actually make this in E. coli? Can we express them? And are they actually folding the where they're supposed to be? And kind of also testing the thermal stability of the designs. Um, so for this workflow, I didn't want to wait to order the designs because I was just really excited. So I decided to kind of learn how to do cloning myself. Uh, so I basically order, order prime primers and did my own, build my own gene. Um, I cut them, optimized everything for E. coli because before I had everything on yeast. Um, and then basically I built the gene. Then I used Gibson assembly to put it in an E. coli vector. Uh, where I, I use a his sumo mini protein construct. Um, after that, I expressed them at 37. I also, again, didn't know what was the best way to kind of go over the expression. I was just trying protocols, but we went with 37 and they work. Um, this is an expression gel from the actual culture. Um, the clone one is right here. Clone two is right here. They were expressing. So that was really exciting. Um, and then we basically use um, iMac and Protea solution to get the designs. And um, as you can see, they're right here. I bas I just have like triplicates of stuff because I just wanted to double check that I was seeing the right thing. Uh, this is clone one. Um, this is the full construct, right? Uh, the his sumo mini protein. This is after the Protea solution. Uh, so I was really excited. So we were able to express them and purify them as well. Um, on the next stage of my workflow, we wanted to check if they were actually folding the way we thought they were folding. And we use, uh, we check for the secondary, secondary structure using CD spec where you can evaluate the circular pol polarized lie of the optical active molecules, such as 
proteins. Um, and right here we can see the characteristic spectrum of the alpha helical protein, where you have pixel 2A and 222, um, which was really excited to see this. Uh, but we also, again, thermal stability. We basically boiled the mini proteins and see what will happen. Uh, we went all the way to 95 and then took the spectrum again. Um, again, it still has the characteristics, it almost looks like the protein is flexing, but you still have characteristics of an alpha helical protein. Uh, again, really excited to see this. Um, and then after that, we basically went back to 20, took the spectrum again, and it's the one right here, which is just as good as the first one. So. Um, I guess this is an indication that even though we went all the way to 95, they didn't denature. Um, again, super excited to get this data. And this is for the lab binder one. So I, it was just so excited. <laughs> and the next step was to basically look at the second one. Uh, for the second one, again, we see the characteristic um, spectrum for an alpha helical protein. Um, I guess when for this one, when we did boil it up all the way to 95 and took the spectrum, um, yeah, this is more maybe, I don't know, it doesn't really have a lot of the helical uh, characteristics, but then after like coming back down and taking the spectrum again, then we can kind of see it folding back into the alpha helical structure again. Um, and this is, I think, really exciting because again, is the, we, I wasn't expecting to see, not that I, I mean, I obviously, I work really hard on the computational part, but just kind of seeing the validation that these designs are capable, that we can start from a single residue, um, that we can express them and purify them and they are binding to lab G, um, has been quite excited. Um, it's been a really <laughs> exciting month for me. Um, and within this, like, right now we know, we kind of characterize some bit, so I just kind of wanted to summarize the things that basically we've done again, and this is kind of like the same outline, right? We know that gram-negative biofilms bio um, are regulated by this really conserved lab system. And we know that we this basically we want to study the system, not just to inhibit biofilms, but to create a tool to understand these mechanisms. Um, I was able to design 12,000 mini protein inhibitors, de novo, um, using the strategy that I mentioned earlier, using the remitter, using the substitution mover, uh, using the interocitor as the main metric to be able to get this designs. And um, also, you know, using so anything to extend the fragments as well. Uh, this is also a really excited tool for computational uh, protein design. Um, and I think that's also something really excited about my project. Like I said, I came into the lab knowing nothing but knowing that I was really passionate about computational biology and protein design and wanting to like expand the tools that we currently have. So it was really exciting to know that we can do this. And then we were able to, again, express everything in bacteria and determine that there are stable helical bundles. Um, within the next steps and maybe even tomorrow, we will have, uh, I will basically want to optimize and actually check the affinity of the Binder lab G. So I plan to use the biolayer interferometry to check for affinity. Uh, and then from there, I can make the choice on how do I need to improve the binding for the novel designs or not. Uh, and at the same time, I want to start doing in vivo validations using um, Sodomonas fluorescence and see if we can get them into the peroplasm and also use them as a tool. You know, initially we needed to understand if we could even make them. Uh, now that we know that we can make them, it's kind of excited to move to the next stage and um, also find tools to get mini proteins across, uh, across the peripleplasm. Um, just really excited to be part of it as well. Um, and I just want to say thank you to my lab because this has been such an amazing year for me and um, especially Super thank you to Frank. Like I said, he was my mentor through all of this, through all the computational stuff, to just creating all the protocols and kind of working together and debugging for a lot of hours. Uh, and also just building Andromeda and having the computational like processes to be able to actually do protein design. Um, like a big thank you to James for teaching me how to do yeast display for Ian and Edson because they taught me how to do protein verification. Um, 
but ideally the whole lab has contributed to teaching me and guiding me through um, a lot of these things. <laughs> I feel like I say this a lot, but I, again, it's been a month of me learning a bunch of experimental techniques and it's just been, I cannot be more grateful to be in this lab. Um, but yeah, that's uh, my presentation. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I had a quick question to start. What binding affinity do you want these binders to have to uh, be successful? That's a great question. Um, so they have never actually tested the binding affini affinity between lab G and lab D. Um, so I am planning on pure, I'm currently purifying lab D and lab, um, the lab D output domain and I will test it myself and kind of see. Um, I don't know what I, the binding affinity I want just yet, but um, yeah, that's, I see, I, like, again, like, I think I, I, I want to measure it with myself and kind of see where we stand. Um, we do know that they don't, that we can compete based on past interactions that they've done with the lab system, uh, but that is not like an exact affinity that I can give right now. Uh, how many clones you you you, you sequenced? Uh, is the clones? I can. Uh, can you repeat that again? Uh, how many how many clones you sequenced? I, so I sort in the two populations that I saw after the flow cytometry, and then I sent about ten colonies for sequencing, and then I saw the two clones. Um, I am planning on maybe sending a few more things for sequencing, but that's, I just basically sequence uh, the code from the sorting um, that I did. Thank you. It's interesting on that note, maybe another quick question. Like you have these hits, was there any other hits that were very close in sequence space to the ones that, um, like you, you synthesize or you computationally designed so many designs, there must be some in there that were just a few single point mutations away, or maybe they're really diverse. There were not things that were close. I, know, I think that's a great question. Uh, I was actually, I haven't sat down fully to uh, evaluate all the data, but I was actually wondering that myself, what makes them, um, there were things that were close when we look at the metrics, right, that are within the same space. Um, but I haven't actually sat down and anal analyzed the, all the sequences myself right now. So I couldn't really give you like a reason why <laughs> right now. Um, but there are definitely things that follow it in the same space, right? They are, they are also like in the middle of a lot of the metrics that we use within Rosetta for binding. Um, but I am looking forward to kind of coming back to the computational um, aspect of my project and kind of fitting the experimental data that I got in so far to understand like as what made the binders um, actually bind to lab team. Uh, do these two clones are very similar to each other? Uh, they're not at all, actually. They, I mean, I can actually maybe go back to yeah, um, they're not really similar. Their interfaces are quite different, which is something that I was also, you know, I wasn't, it's kind of interesting to see, but also this clone is kind of binding right here. This one is kind of binding more towards this way. I can tell you that like for one clone, it is on a loop, um, like the tryptophan is held like in the middle of the loop right here. But for this one, the tryptophan, even though I always kept the tryptophan in a loop, sometimes it's almost like, in between the loop and the helix. So right here, you can kind of see it right here. You're forming more of an interface with the helix. Um, and then right here, you're kind of forming an interface with the loop. So they're both really different designs from each other. And sequence-wise, um, they are too. We still see the same characteristics that we chose based on, right? Having the hydrophobic core and um, you know our hydrophilic surfaces, but then the interface is quite different. What about the cores of the two proteins? Do they have significant similarities? Uh, yeah, the cores are similar overall. Uh, OK. So I think the main difference is like the interface residues. 
Sorry, was there another question? <laughs> I guess it's it's sort of a, a question about does Rosetta frequently converge to a similar sequence when you create a three helix bundle? What do you like once you generate the sequence? I mean, I think all of the sequence were quite unique. Um, I think, I guess for the core, you will have similar sequence because when we use layer design, right? We do want this, the cores just to be really stable hydrophobic cores. So we only allow certain amino acids to be designed within the core. Um, and I think where you see the main diversity is really the interface, right? Um, but they still, all of them were quite unique. Uh, I also double checked that when I was ordering, making sure that, I guess I double checked that all the interfaces needed to be unique so that I wasn't ordering like the same interface for the science because then, I mean, at the end of the day, I was testing for binding. So that I did check that before making the order. Hey, Paula. So that's a really nice talk. Uh, could you tell me a little bit more about uh, what you showed in the future directions about the assay to test uh, whether they are, they've stopped the biofilm formation? Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of directions now that we found binders. I am collaborating to basically do the in vivo validation on pseudomonas. Um, but we also, you know, we could try to do some competitive assays in vitro as well. That's why I'm kind of purifying lab D and see if we can disrupt the interaction. Um, I am also kind of learning about the biofilm assays uh, myself right now. Um, but I was also planning on, you know, lab G is a conserve, uh, like I said, assists, the lab system is a conserve system in biofilm. So I was also planning on testing the binders against other lab G from other organisms that form biofilms. Um, but that's kind of where I'm, I'm kind of now, now that I know that I can make them kind of figuring out the direction and working with my collaborators to do the in vivo validation for them. I think back at the beginning, you, you mentioned, I think, that the three helix bundle was working the best and that the larger ones were, were not. Um, could you expand on that a little bit in like what, what exactly you mean by that, that the, the bigger ones didn't work as well? Yeah. Um, so when I originally started designing, we didn't have the remeter. So it was kind of difficult to stabilize the tryptophan interaction. So my initial approach, um, once I, well, first I tried to put it on a helix and that wasn't that successful. Then I decided to put it on a loop, but then it was hard to kind of stabilize that interaction and also make an interface. And this is all also previous of having the interocitor. Um, this is my, my first stages. And then I decided, well, maybe if we can add more helices, then we can see you know, create more stable interactions. And so I actually designed four helix, five helix bundles, six helix bundles. And what I continuously saw when I was using the Rosetta metrics was that they were making the same interactions as a mini protein. They weren't more stable um, or they will just kind of do the three helix bundle interaction and then just kind of build on top of that but it wasn't really adding any stability based on the Rosetta metrics. And so that was kind of like my initial, I don't know if it's worth building this huge thing when it's actually having the same characteristics of a three helix bundle. Um, and then after that, uh, you know, we worked with Frank, Frank generated the interocitor and I actually served as a, let me test all of these designs and see how the interocitor and this cooperativity is like scores overall. Then I realized that the three helix bundle was always the more stable. So I created a, lo a lot of like, um, you know, I've just basically evaluated five different design strategies where the mini protein three helix bundle was always the most successful overall for the Rosetta scores, um, especially checking for shape complementary and um, the stability of the core as well. So it, it was 
mostly on the stability side that you saw a difference and on the interface side it was basically that you weren't getting any benefit from making it bigger so yeah less stable according to, to the metrics you were calculating there was not really any point in it that. yeah and i mean i think yeah the interface that we're making all of them were making about the same interface that the three helix bundle was making but they all had about the same stability and i know again it was also maybe a choice that i made from like knowing that I'm already kind of building from a single residue, but I know that three Helix, Helix bundles have worked in the past. So I didn't want to deviate too much from what we kind of already know about protein design, but now kind of creating this new tool um, as well. But yeah, I never really saw anything built a better interface than just the three Helix bundle. I have a question about that single anchor residue. Like, it seems like you put a lot of emphasis on that for the whole project. Did you really have going in like a mutational study of the natural complex where mutating that prevented binding? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Yes, so that is, well, one, there were crystal structures for lab, um, G and lab D. Um, they did a lot of uh, mutation studies on the interactions of the complex. The tryptophan was the main anchor point, so we know that. Um, initially, I even thought about starting, you know, again, using our rational driven design where we start from a helix um, that already has an interface, right? And even the mutation analysis they done, done before in this complex, like it almost like the, there's not a lot of interactions with the helix. It's the tryptophan. They have me try to mutate different stuff. And every time it's just the tryptophan is the main cause that anchors that interaction. So I did have all this data previously. Uh, which is exciting. I'm also working with the people who kind of work, have discovered and have worked with this system for a while, um, and they know this about the tryptophan. So it was a good system to also design from a single residue because of mm. that. Is there a methodological difference between a rheumator and an inverse rotomer? Are they created in a different way? think maybe Frank wants to come in a little more on that. So the reason we call them rotomers is because inverse rotomers is already taken to mean uh, rotomers that were numbered backwards. So where the lowest numbered chi angle is the farthest from the alpha carbon and vice versa. Um, but the kinematic inheritance stays the same in rotomers, inverse rotomers as Rosetta understands them. So we just decided to reverse the word rotomer. <laughs> I'm not sure I followed that. No. So kind of one of like a, 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 a residue is normally the kind that's closest to the alpha carbon, whereas as you increase in number, you go farther and farther out. Inverse rotomers, that numbering is reversed. But the idea is still that you are turning the side chain. So Rosetta had a thing called inverse rotomers already that was still, as far as we were concerned, not suitable. So we just, the idea with round horse is the numbering stays the same, but what moves changes. Whereas for inverse rotomers, the kinematics stay the same, but the numbering changes. Is there not a grafting based approach based on fanning out these rotomers and then grafting them on that? Well, I mean, I've seen, I've read some Rosetta papers that use this approach. I can't recall the name of it. I guess that's just not as efficient as what you've implemented here, right? Uh, maybe it's a question, the method side, Frank, or I don't know. Yeah, so I guess. Maybe you're talking about a sawing, uh, which is kind of, so anything is an extension of that as well. Um, oh, sorry. I think this is just about a specific motif, like known, a known oh. residue interaction. You're trying to find um, maybe backbones that are suitable for a possible uh, bound side chain. And you're really trying to, to, to find who, yeah, I guess. Yes, in the past we'll use hash doc. Um, hmm. and, um, just to put fragments into hotspot residues. Um, the other way that, it, yeah, is super common is motif graft. And that generally works best when you have a contiguous stretch of amino acids that are inter interacting with your target. Um, oh, got it. And so that, that's generally why you want like starting from a helix 
and then putting putting a protein. So both of those are docking strategies where you have to have a library of existing proteins that you can dock against a um, a surface where you have a, maybe a couple contiguous hotspot residues. Um, but you have to already have a pre-computed library of proteins and then have some idea of what your interface needs to look like, generally multiple hotspot residues. This is just one hotspot residue in this case, though. Yep. OK. Is it uh, easier to design a uh, peptide uh, than they done this um, a mini, a mini protein or not? Is it I, easier to do than peptide or this um, um, mini protein? So they have in the past, they try to design peptides with the tryptophan motif, basically, like based on that. Um, but they weren't successfully, I mean, they don't have, they weren't able to do any in vivo validation with them. Um, I guess, I don't know, like to me, right, using this approach, it's, a, the approach we chose is also just because, you know, we can kind of use the best of both worlds, right? The mini proteins are just small as a peptide, but they also, you know, we can engineer the functionality, like with the, pro, like with the protein tools we have. We can also think about, right, we, we want to target the system. It has to go through the bird blossom. So being able to engineer them better and having the second, third structure seems like a more viable solution. Um, yeah. We should talk briefly about the going through the periplasm strategy. That seems <laughs> a hard challenge. You have to modify your surface to be like a little less uh, soluble or something yeah like being more permeable to go through it yeah i mean i think this is also it's exciting to use it as a tool to try to go into the periplasm right maybe we can like you said redesign the surfaces to make them more permeable to go through the outer membrane um we can maybe use um nanoparticles right and code them like use or maybe even use probiotic um um is there a library based assay for that like that you can do some kind of fluorescence cell sorting thing i don't know if anyone's ever constructed that i'm not sure about that that'll be interesting that's I think yeah, probably biofilm assays is that it's easy to multiplex and automate them hmm Uh, another question: Did you compare the binding on the uh, binding energy between uh, lab D and uh, the mini pro the uh, the mini pro protein? Yeah, um, I didn't add it to the graphs that I show, but basically, the cutoffs you see right here, right? Like you see that I, uh, they're all based on how the native interaction score with Rosetta. So I initially, in order to filter, my first thing was. Um, I scored the native interaction and based on what Rosetta gave me, uh, my designs have to be as good as the native interaction or better. Um, since I also like didn't have, yeah, but basically that's my approach and kind of evaluating and choosing the designs. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, if you compare to uh, the lab D band, uh, the, the banding affinity of uh, lab D. Oh, so they, they have never yeah. actually measured the lab the affinity of the lab D to lab G protease. So I am planning of doing that in the lab. And I also am planning to measure, I haven't done those experimental, like uh, I haven't done that yet. Um, I was planning to make, hopefully trying to do that month, like tomorrow and Friday and get that data so we can compare the affinities. And we can even try to do the competition assays as well. Uh, but when I did all the sorting, I. Um, the concentration of lab G was 300 nanomolar uh, for to get the binders. And then now I have to kind of go and really standardize what's the affinity of the binders. I know you said earlier that you weren't quite sure what your target affinity was, but 
Um, have you thought about, like, let's say you have something that the E. coli express proteins do show clear binding? Have you thought about, but but they're not high enough to for whatever you have in mind? Do you have any thoughts about how you could then, like, a sort of affinity mature your 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 starting um, designs uh, further? Um, and do you have any comment on 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 what you might think about doing in that front? Yeah, I guess I'm not sure yet. <laughs> uh, I mean, the idea was right. If I can get the VLI data and kind of evaluate it, um, maybe then I could go on and do affinity maturation at that point. Um, but I'm still like, I, I guess I'm still kind of just want to know the affinity first kind of maybe the competition. And then that was my initial goal to maybe go into affinity maturation. Um, I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm still kind of in the learning process of that as well, so. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I was just curious if you had started thinking about it already. Yeah. And the nice thing about the, the yeast assay is it's really easy for you to basically just make designs starting from like now you could make 12,000 designs based on like starting from your two starting models and 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 test those in the same way. So that, that makes it really nice to to like start working your way up if, if that's necessary. Of course, we don't you don't know if it's even necessary. So yeah, yeah, I see. I think that's kind of where I'm at. I got the CD data on Friday, kind of got everything together on Monday. And then so my next step was to the BLI, kind of make the choice on what's the, now that we kind of have an affinity, where do we want to move forward now and, you know, start doing the actual in vivo validation. But I, yeah, I have started thinking about that, right? Um, especially using the yeast display technology as well. Our general strategy for affinity maturation is uh, site saturating mutagenesis. Just every single possible point mutation. Yeah. Make them in a new oligo pool, sort it, and we can start combining affinity enhancing mutations in the second round of design. It's a good question. Will you try to do that computationally first? Okay. Then not even for the, 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 you know, hypothetical or theoretical interest of it. Sorry, what was the, I, I mean, you can do site saturation mutagenesis computationally as well, just to see. Yes, sort of, that, uh, that is what I want to see. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that would be interesting to see. I think, um, yeah, you're right. That would be actually interesting to see as well. Um, I feel like now that I kind of got all the experimental data, I'm definitely excited to just kind of sit back into the computational aspect and we kind of really evaluate this science and I mean that's something that I can definitely look um, into for sure. Yeah if your system's set up already for experimental screening it's probably just as easy to order yeah. you know, 20 substitutions at one position as as five at one position so. Yeah I know. <laughs> but it's definitely still interesting like just again I think I, I just really like computational stuff. And now that you mentioned it, I just kind of got I'm like, oh, that would be interesting just to kind of learn too as well. So I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So I guess if uh, no other questions, it was a really excellent discussion. Um, thanks, Paula, for an awesome presentation. Let's thank Paula one more time. And um, yeah, Paula starts grad school in uh, this fall in a couple months. Um, so 
all really excited she's going to stick around in Boston um, in the Harvard uh, Chem Bio program. And uh, yeah, I'm glad she's going to stay in the community. Um, this is an amazing start to a scientific career. So I, everyone, I can speak for everyone here and say we're looking forward to see, to see what you do in the next couple of years. So thanks again. Thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Thank you. <laughs>